Welcome back to Nick's Knacks, and today's knack is yet again the Digital Non-Secure Voice Terminal, or the TA-1042. I hope you're enjoying this because we have quite a few more of these in store. For those of you who joined us for the first video, we gave an overview of the development process for this project and a quick demo on one of these earlier Blinken Lights units. We're now selling these on Tindy, and so I wanted to cover what we have working so far and talk about the ordering options. And we'll call this DNVT video one and a half so as to not disturb the original ordering. I've been quite pleasantly surprised at the amount of enthusiasm for the first video. Apparently I'm not the only one who thinks old military telephones are fun, and I wanted to thank everyone for their support through this video. We did get a write-up on Hackaday, which was awesome to see. Unfortunately, we did sell out of the units on Tindy, but we have another 10 being built and have ordered a larger batch of the RJ45 units. Just bear with us as we order these units, as there are a couple of suppliers and there's lead times and shipping for uh, different manufacturers. So. For ordering, we have a couple options. You can order the fully assembled and tested board like this, or you can order a uh, partially assembled kit. So JLC PCB is able to solder most of the components, but there are a few remaining to solder. The soldering is not that bad. In the current kit, all the SMT soldering is done and you only need to solder the through hole components. It took me about 25 minutes. In the next order, Rob managed to get JLC PCB to solder everything except the transformers and the DC barrel jack. So we'll update the listing once we receive those, and those will be a lot quicker to assemble uh, if you want to get the kit and save some money. And we now have two versions of the board, a terminal block version and an RJ45 version. Um, the RJ45 ports are a bit cheaper and allow you to use off-the-shelf CAT5 cables. And we'll also be offering these uh, RJ45 to TA1042 adapter boards that look like this. They basically allow you to adapt the RJ45 directly to the field telephone without plugging in wires. Uh, but this fits most of the phones, or all the phones we've tested so far. We do, as a convenience, offer a 48 volt power supply but it's cheaper for you to order it directly on Amazon and we provide a link to the part. If you want to use multiple of these, the power requirement per switch with four phones should be 250 milliamps. So you can use a splitter with a larger 48 volt power supply and each line has a resettable thermal fuse. So don't worry about overcurrent. We do charge a premium for having us assemble because it's a lot of work and I have a day job, but I think the full kit should be a good compromise because it has most of the things assembled and it's not gonna be a ton of work. If you want just the board with no components, it's quite a bit cheaper. So just send us an email. Uh, it's designed to match a particular size slide in case, <laughs> but could be mounted in other types of enclosures. On the firmware version, we have several new features. We have USB device mode implemented, which can send the raw CVSD data to the computer, send the status of each line to the host and supports commands uh, back and forth for ring, ring dismiss, disconnect, etc. The other main thing we've added is line supervision functionality, which will periodically pull each line and display whether a DNVT is connected. So uh, if they're not connected, you'll see dash 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 on the screen. And once it's connected, uh, it will identify that it's there and switch it to idle. And I've also released a demo program that shows off the USB interface. And so we can take multiple of these and switch in between them. And we're working on connecting them to various VoIP methods, probably asterisk, or maybe some custom thing. All right, let's head over to the bench and do a walkthrough of the software to date. Just to recap, this is the current version of the switch. These are the Chinese I squared C units. It's sort of, you know, Chinese cell phone type things. Pretty fun little devices. But basically what these are here is fully self-contained switches that'll interface with these DNVTs, provide them power. So they take uh, USB-C and they can either be from a computer or a uh, power supply. And as well, they also take a high voltage DC, which is usually 48 volts up to 56 volts uh, on the back side, which gives the power to these. And they can run over quite long distances. We did the math, something like four kilometers that you can actually extend two twisted pairs out to these types of phones before you, you get enough attenuation that they won't receive properly. So these... Um, are obviously DNVTs. These are the TA1042s. These are obviously our favorite models. They have kind of a really cool design and a good industrial type UX. And they also support the local battery mode and the common battery mode. But in each mode, they support 16 and 32 kilohertz. Um, with local battery mode, you can set these both to 32 and, and send them point to point and they'll ring and sort of interact that way. But when you're ready to connect these to the switches, they're going to have to be set to common battery mode. Um, if you buy one of these other type devices, um, this is the uh, TA-1035. Um, these, these have several differences. Number one, they're a little clunkier. They got this kind of metal bracket in the top to seat the phone in. Um, 
I, I wouldn't recommend these, honestly. If you can find the TA-1042s, they're better. But these have some subtle differences. Uh, the TA-1035 is going to support only 16 kilohertz, although, at least in the ones we've tried, that's, that's the deal. And the TA-954, instead of a data port, it has a selector switch to select from 16 or 32 kilohertz, but they're not going to support the local battery mode, so it's, it's only useful with the switch. So, again, make sure if, before you connect these, these are going to be set to 32 kilohertz CB. If you end up with a 16 kilohertz only phone, you're going to have to switch every phone on the switch to 16 kilohertz. And it hasn't been implemented yet, but there's going to be a dip switch setting in here to toggle the 16 kilohertz mode. Um, there are mixed compatibility 1632 modes available on the switch, but we haven't implemented them yet. So, all 16 or all 32, basically, and we recommend you get a 32 uh, capable phone. So when you plug these into the switch, and if your computer is off or not running the, the new USB program, um, this is going to display uh, inactive. And what that means is that this switch is currently in what we're calling line simulator mode. It's basically a demo program that enables you to test out switching up to four phones. And I mean, it's quite useful for switching up to four phones, but obviously not beyond that because this, this interface is going to only have four lines total. So what you can do in this mode is, you know, plug up in up to four phones, and one of the new changes is line supervision on these lines. So at some sort of interval, it's going to actually ping out on the line and, and determine if it can actually talk to the phone. And that's one of the cool things about digital phones is they'll actually reply when activated. So we can discern whether a line is idle or it is actually unconnected. Um, just a note on the line supervision feature, um, this is programmed to query the phone when you first apply power and then every 10 minutes thereafter. And in addition, obviously, if you try to ring the phone, it's going to query that as well. So um, one of the notes is that when the query actually happens, this is momentarily going to flicker and you're going to hear a click out of the handset as the phone actually activates when it sends the Q command down the line. Um, so that can be a little bit annoying. So we do have the option with a dip switch to disable that, check the manual. But if you flip that on, it is only going to check for inactivity when the phone is actually rung. So in order to use this, all you have to do is basically connect your phones up. Just double check that they're getting connectivity with that line. And then as soon as you pick this up, it's going to go into a dial mode. And that's going to produce a synthetic, you know, non... It's a non-NANPA uh, dial tone that you can hear there. And that uh, we use that because it actually, number one, it was easier to implement when I was just mashing bits into a single packet to get it to work. But it's also going to indicate to you that this is in a... Um, line simulator mode and not in a uh, switch mode through a computer or in any other, you know, console redirection or stuff like that. And then when we provided a normal dial tone from the computer, that's going to indicate that it's not. So it's useful feedback. What we've done is simplified the dial plan a little bit. So every single extension here is going to be one digit for the number of phone. It's equivalent to that there. So you see we've picked up extension four and that indicates dial. Extension three is idle. So if we go ahead and press that button, that's going to ring. You can pick this up and it'll complete the call. When you're in that mode, you're going to go ahead and see traffic on both. And as soon as you hang up extension three, that's going to go back to idle and this is going to return to the dial state. So you can make another call to a different extension or you can just hang it up like that. Uh, in addition, of course, my favorite mode, if you press the R key, I, I apologize. I, <laughs> I had to do it, guys. I had to do it. So um, in the back here, we obviously, this is the RJ45 model and that has two RJ45 ports. The pinout is, is articulated in a rather detailed fashion, so it'll give you the exact color pairs, the phone it's going to, and which color on the phone it should be attached to. Obviously, these are the positive, these are the negative, and uh, each of the two positives need to be connected to get the data going in, in each direction. And then there's four lines here, but obviously only two RJ45 ports. So for some f fun stuff we implemented, or Rob actually designed these uh, RJ45 adapter boards, and these just kind of plug right into the top of the phone. And because two phone lines are coming over this, which is connected directly to the switch over there, we have one to the switch and then one uh, daisy chain capable port. So this is the, the second phone that goes over to the other port and connects right into the switch port there. So that enables you to run a single Cat5 cable with eight wires, four pairs, and drive two phones. And you can connect one or connect a second one off of Daisy Chain if you need two lines in one place. Um, at some point in time, we may offer a splitter. Just be aware that these uh, the pinout is not precisely aligned with the uh, 
the 10100 Ethernet standard, so a standard kind of splitter type device won't work. But the entire pinout is going to be written on the back there for those. You know, you can just chop off a cable and just clamp them down. These work great for that. The other option we have is obviously old school, and we talked about this, but this is the terminal block version. And this is a little bit more expensive because these terminal block connectors are a bit pricier than the RJ45s. But that's going to enable you to insert a, a bare wire in there. You press down on that little button there with a the screwdriver and just insert your stripped, you know, cable you stole out of your, <laughs> your, your old Ethernet cable. And then that's going to interface with the phone just by plugging it in there. Just ignore the data cable. That's <laughs> future, future work. So again, same screen, same behavior. And in this case, we only have one line connected on this phone, obviously, and so it's gonna show idle. And then this phone is obviously not gonna be super useful, um, but in the line simulator mode, I did actually burn in a uh, two different tones. So if in this case, we have lines three and four active, if we dial a line that's inactive, you're gonna get a busy signal, which is just a repeated tone. This is the connection fail state, as you can see there. And then all you have to do is press another key and you'll go right back to the dial mode and you'll get the regular dial tone. In addition, if you dial an extension that doesn't exist, it's gonna give you a recording of me, of me simulating the AT&T lady, cause why not? That was kind of fun to record and burn into the firmware there. So the version 0.31 includes USB uh, interfaces that enable us to connect it to the computer and effectively put the device into a pass-through mode when it detects the presence of an application that's pulling data from it. So we have a couple different modes. We have NC for not connected. So if you just plug this right into like a USB charger, you're going to get NC because it's not connected to a computer. The inactive means that the device has been enumerated and is recognized by the computer. So if you run LSUSB, you're going to see that device there, but the program that's controlling it and interfacing with it is not running. And if that program hasn't been detected in a period of time, it'll switch back to the inactive mode and just function as regular line simulator. There is a dip setting now to switch it to uh, computer only if, you, if you're going to be using this for only switched op operation and you want to make sure that it's not going to ever present the line simulator mode, which can be a bit confusing if, if people didn't know that that was there. There's a dip switch you can flip and then it will essentially give a busy tone to people until such point that you connect the computer to it. So let's take a little look at that console application. So briefly, as soon as we execute this console application, you're gonna see it has enumerated all the devices here and is now presenting them in order. In this case, we have um, eight phones available because we have two switches connected to it, which is eight total lines. And I, I haven't quite tested how many we can get away with, but it's probably quite a few because the bandwidth requirement for these is not high. It's about four bytes a millisecond in data payload plus some you know, overhead for status communication. So there's two representations of state here. We have the switch state, which is kind of a representation of what you're seeing on the display here, which is presented on the console. And then on the right, we have the computer state. Uh, in the end column, you'll see the dial digits and R is the recording index, which you'll see. So if I take this phone off the hook now with the USB console connected, you're gonna see I get to USB dial and you're gonna actually hear a, uh, a precise tone plan dial, an input dial, whatever you wanna call it, and you'll see that recording is ticking along. So the dial plan here is zero, follow, you know, zero, one up to however many phones you have at the moment. And so what we can do is dial zero, one, and it's gonna trigger that phone to ring. And you, it may seem like this is exactly the same thing as before, but I can actually press this button and communicate between these two phones just as if they were connected to the same switch. And in the background, the data is actually being passed from this phone to the switch over the USB endpoint through this console application, which has connected the two phones internally out to this switch targeted to this phone because they dialed each other, which was pretty fun. Um, the reason we implemented this first is A, because of a proof of concept. So we just wanted to be able to show that we could do that. And um, also that we wanted to be able to uh, enable just basic functionality without getting anything too complex. So this is just a basic console C application. And, and to be fair, this should be considered a proof of concept. This is not production ready code. I'll, I'll be working on that. Version 0.31 has a few bugs. Sometimes if you dial, it doesn't ring the first time. Working on all that. But yes, yeah, so we have additional modes, USB dial and USB traffic that are both passed through. And those will enable console applications to interact with this. And in future plans, we want to interface this with asterisk or some other internet connected capacity um, so that we can interconnect these just like a regular phone. Um, 
if you exit this program, so that it was an incursus window basically, but what you can see is that it's you know loading some re recordings and then it goes through and enumerates the devices. And one of the things to note is that each uh, interface, their CAFE 6942 of course is our vidpid, but it's gonna enumerate the firmware version as well as a unique ID there, the serial number row there. And that is actually a hex encoded version of the unique board ID inside the Pico. That's gonna enable us to individually identify each of these boards. And if you have a configuration file, you can assign what order you want and map extensions to them, etc. And it also enables this to uh, understand the, the version that it's talking to and ensure that it's compatible. So lastly, let's say that you uh, need to install firmware on your DNVT switch here. So, you know, let's say hypothetically you finished assembling the board here and you're ready to test it out. Um, so, the nice thing about the Pico is if you have just installed a fresh Pico H, as soon as you plug in the USB cable here, it is actually going to mount automatically on your computer. So in this case I have uh, version 0.31, I can just drag that over, and we're flashed and you'll notice that it is alive again. So after flashing, we see that the screen is active, but beware that this screen is powered off the USB cable and it doesn't necessarily give power to the, uh, <laughs> the phones. So take your 48 volt power supply and plug that into the back and the DC barrel jack. This is, you know, 48 to 56 volts. It'll actually run off a wide tolerance, but. So the switch is currently doing line supervision. So you'll notice as soon as I plug this phone set in, both of these will go to idle. Now, if you want to update these, we have two options here. Number one is this firmware update button. So the device, obviously the uh, Pico button is not accessible from the outside. So you can go ahead and take a, a small screwdriver and press that button. And the device will go into firmware update mode. Um, and then you'll see it mounts there. And you can perform the same flashing operation by copying that UF2 file over. The other really nifty thing we have is the ability to send a vendor specific uh, USB command. So I can go ahead and call the update DNVT firmware binary. That'll go ahead and throw this into the firmware update mode without any user intervention. And that can be done, you know, individual on the switch address. And that'll allow us to then go ahead and copy a firmware update right on over to the RPI Pico without having to press any buttons, which is super cool. So that's all for this one. Thanks for watching. If you're curious what's coming up, we've got video two, the hardware overview with Rob, where he talks about reverse engineering and implementing the DNVT interface with modern components. Video three is the nuts and bolts of embedded programming here which is a bit of a tutorial on the Pico. Then video four will cover USB programming and getting the console app to run. Then a bunch of stuff we haven't slotted for videos yet. I also managed to find a crazy looking fax machine with the DNVT data cable on the back of it. So we're gonna test that out. And we're also going to attempt to use this with VoIP. First, probably add a you know simple WebSocket support to, to demo it, which I think would be kind of fun project and allow people to just kind of communicate between these as soon as they uh, receive it. And then we're looking for asterisk support in some fashion. I'm gonna take a look at whether it's easier to use the Dottie interface, which it uses for like its normal line cards or SIP. Um, not, not clear yet, but my friend has offered to help me, so I'll take a look with him. We're also going to investigate a plain old telephone system version of this device to work with the TA312s with DTMF or like any other analog phone. If you have any questions or tips or <laughs> other comments, feel free to shoot me an email through nicksnacks.net or you can join the Nicksnacks Discord server in the link below. If you're looking for information about the product, we do have a product webpage on the Nicksnacks website that has a full overview of the different links, buying options, source, board schematic files, everything you'd possibly want. Till next time, Nick with Nick Snacks, have a great day.